Welcome to the next in a series of webinars brought to you by PKF Texas. We were pleased to welcome Nicole Riley of PKF Texas, Matt Kuhlman of the Senecor Foundation, and Jennifer Yancey of the Houston Area Women's Center to discuss adapting to new daily challenges facing not-for-profits. This presentation was recorded live on August 6, 2020 as a Zoom webinar. All information was accurate and current at that time. Those viewing this recording now are not eligible to receive CPE credit from PKF Texas. If you have questions regarding this webinar or future PKF Texas webinars, please feel free to email us at jlemansky at pkftexas.com and we will get back to you as soon as possible. Well, good morning, everyone. I hope everybody's having a great morning so far today. We'd like to welcome you to adapting to new daily challenges facing not-for-profits. We appreciate you joining us this morning. Just a few housekeeping things. Everything, everyone who attends this live webinar today will receive CPE credit administered by PKF Texas. In addition to attendance, you will need to answer one of the polling questions the panelists have prepared today in order to be eligible to receive the CPE. Panelists are happy to answer questions throughout the presentation in addition to Q&A time at the end. Please submit your question through the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and indicate who you would like to answer your questions. Uh, our moderator today is Nicole Riley. She's a senior manager at PKF Texas and one of the leaders of our not-for-profit team. She has been providing audit and consulting surface, services to the not-for-profit community for 14 years. She works closely with the management and board of directors of her clients in meeting reporting regulatory requirements while providing value and helping them become more efficient and effective in their missions. Up next, we have Matt Kuhlman. He's the Vice President and Chief Financial Officer for Senecor Foundation. He joined Senecor in 2002. As a member of the Executive Leadership Committee for Senecor, Matt is responsible for timely and accurate financial statements, ca ongoing cash flow projections, oversight over accounting and finance operations, as well as the design and maintenance of the financial reporting structures. Finally, Emily Whitehurst unfortunately had an unavoidable conflict arise, so Jennifer Yancey, Chief Development Officer for the Houston Area Women's Center, has agreed to fill in for her. Jennifer is responsible for setting the strategic direction and providing oversight and management of all the fundraising operations for Hawk. She has nearly 30 years of experience in the nonprofit, finance, higher education, and economic development sectors, and is an active volunteer. Jennifer, thanks so much for filling in for Emily. And Nicole, I'll turn it over to you. All right. Well, thank you everyone for tuning in and listening to our first nonprofit webinar. And thank you, Jennifer and Matt, for being part of this. We really appreciate you being here. Uh, many of you are, are familiar uh, about or familiar with PKF Texas, but for those of you that are not, just a quick little um, info. We're a middle market CPA firm, and we do the full service of audit, tax, and consulting services here at the firm, and we're based here in Houston. Today, we are going to talk about the daily challenges that many non-for-profits face and how they have to adapt and change and, and address many of these challenges. Um, they really have to be flexible to be um, able to survive and grow and, and stay relevant and really provide, uh, provide services and, and be successful in their mission. Before we jump into the panel questions, we, we just wanted to kind of get a little bit of a quick poll of the room and see I guess kind of get a pulse of the, the room this morning and see, you know, what is your position at the, uh, at a nonprofit that you're with? Are you a board member? Are you an executive team member? I'm just a member of the staff. Um, or do you provide services to nonprofits? Just a service provider. If you can answer the question for us, that will give us kind of just a little bit of a pulse of who's listening today. We'll give it just one more second. Thank you, Jen. Uh, several, several service providers with us today, some staff members, and like kind of a, a wide variety. Uh, that's great. I really appreciate you guys answering that. And then, you know, we're just gonna jump right in and we'll start with Jennifer this morning. Jennifer, what is the biggest challenge that you think Hawk is facing right now? 
Um, well, like many nonprofits, I think right now we're so COVID related, but I truly think that a lot of the, the strategies and stuff that we um, do at Ad Hoc and all nonprofits can be applied to any sort of um, changing environment. But we were deemed an essential service uh, during the pandemic, and therefore uh, we do operate a 24 hour hotline, we do operate a residential shelter. And so being, um, having to operate that shelter during a COVID outbreak, and these are our domestic violence sexual assault clients who, who were housing as, long, as well as their children. So the daily operations of that, we actually have a school um, in our residential campus. It's a Houston ISD school. So we were also operating a school and helping those, those parents um, homeschool their children. So I think that's been one of our biggest challenges. Um, the exponential increase in our demand for our services because of the type of agency that we are, our calls to our hotline have increased by about 40%. Um, we've actually opened up a second shelter, uh, quasi shelter in a hotel to be able to accommodate all of the demand uh, for our services. And then working remotely, that's been really challenging because that's not something that we did. We had an administration and ed an education building, we held group counseling. So all of that is having to be done remotely and so uh, not only the operations of the remote um, op op operations and how we're having to do that, but communicating with people is very difficult during these times. Thank you. Um, yeah, this is definitely a strange world we're all living in um, and having to figure out as, as we go along. Matt, what would you guys say that Senecor's biggest challenge is? Sure. Along with the lines of what Jennifer was talking about, I would say that our our world is revolving around COVID right now. Like many not for profits, I think um, there are a lot of services that are probably needed right now due to COVID. But I think that our biggest challenge outside of COVID is probably the need for services outweighs the funding, um, either the funding funding availability or the rates at which the the funding uh, pays for those services. Uh, we're, we're really related to the healthcare industry. So a lot of our funding comes from government grants as well as insurance, Medicaid and private pay. And those rates are what we're dependent upon. And the services for substance abuse uh, definitely outweighs the funding availability here in the state of Texas. Um, you, you know, we, we can provide those needed services, but then uh, as we bring more people into those needed services, that has an impact on the quality. Um, that we end up providing those services for, and we end up uh, that can just lead to more need uh, more than anything. Um, we've had to get really creative uh, during this challenge because of the economic uncertainties of COVID, but uh, look, looking for other funding sources, collaborating with other organizations to offset some of our services, um, as well as looking to reduce cost and, and waste, um, ensuring that our, our mission doesn't overtake the margin uh, having a healthy balance between the two and knowing the limits uh, of the mission against the funding, what I like to call mission creep, where we're, we're, where we're reaching outside of more than what we can handle. And we need to focus on just the services that we provide by collaborating with a lot of other organizations. But I would say in addition to that, the, the COVID challenges that we've had, a lot of economic uncertainty around that um, in order to return or continue with full operations, we're taking advantage of a lot of assistance, such as forgivable loans um, and other program grants that are available out there. Um, but this is gonna lead us to probably having a, a greater need for services because of uh, the pandemic that's currently taking place. Mm -hmm. All right, well, thank you. And we wanted also to find out from our, our listeners what you feel like your biggest challenges, and this is a little bit non-COVID related, more general, you know, what is it that you feel your issue, that you know, your most, your biggest challenges are in your organization? You know, is it finding and retaining staff? Is it the fundraising, the challenges? Um, you know, there's, you're always trying to do more with less in nonprofits, I feel like. Um, IT and keeping on current technology or board retention is also a challenge, getting great board members that are, involved in the mission and dedicated to the mission. We'll give that a couple more seconds here. If you can all um, provide us a quick answer on what you guys feel is a significant challenge for you this morning. All right. 
And <laughs> fundraising is definitely a a big challenge. And then staffing IT. Great. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for, for answering that question. And we are going to get to most of those uh, those topics. And I think we're going to go ahead and start with staffing because this is a especially with COVID and all the remote working and the the need for protection and safety. Um, it's always, you know, staffing, even pre-COVID, was a huge challenge for nonprofits, I feel like. You know, you're trying to compete with the corporations um, on wages and benefits. Um, it's also, it can, it can be a little more challenging and it, a, of a job sometimes with the, the program mission and the the need to be efficient and effective in providing our and you know being successful in our mission. But um, Matt, we'll start with you. You know, what are some things that you that Senecor is doing to find and retain great qualified staff members? Well, for re for retention, I, I think one of the one of the big things that we like to focus on is culture and leadership training that really um, um, you know solidifies the, the the employees that we have. Um, we, we've recently, well, I would say recently, we have over the past several years had a mentoring program that we've done with our managers and leadership where we provided, a, a, you know, additional training and then pairing them with mentors um, so that we can build our, our succession plan with our managers and our leaders. We currently have approximately about 400 plus employees. And so we want to make sure that we're growing the organization through leadership and culture. What comes along with that mentoring program we've also done is offered additional tuition reimbursement for those employees, which has been a, um, um, a, a huge uh, impact on bringing new, new, new employees in and then also retaining the current employees that we have. And that helps also grow the organization within as far as the leadership is concerned. Um, that, that's one of the things that we have done, but we've noticed that providing those additional resources for those employees through leadership and training, um, they're, they're, the employees are really looking for something like that. Um, they, they also, uh, a lot of employees, in it, um, they want to know that your organization is financially stable. And that can be difficult with not-for-profit organizations. An employee coming in wants to know that, hey, they've got a, a job or a career for the next five to 10 years uh, based on the financial uh, stability of, of the, of the not-for-profit. And, uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of not-for-profits, um, think of themselves as only providing, um, uh, financials to a, a zero bottom line, which in turn, uh, a, a lot of times not-for-profits have to have a, a profitable, profitable bottom line in order to cover their capital investments, uh, for the organization. So, working towards making sure that you have a stable margin retains employees and has a big impact on on keeping um, on them working for your organization. Yeah, um, if for those of you on that have heard me speak before, I, I'm a big proponent of a not-for-profit is it's tax stat like a tax status. It's you're an exempt for tax purposes. It is not a way of operating um, without having something at the bottom line, strategic planning, how, you know, even just doing new programs and being able to adapt and change becomes much more difficult when you don't have a healthy reserve there to, to utilize when it's needed. And I, I mean, COVID is one of the, you know, prime examples of if you didn't have a reserve and you were operating at break even on a daily basis, reacting and being able to do things that you need to do right now is even more challenging than it would have been had you had some some healthy reserves there yeah and i think that those that that financial stability that an off, that an offer profit can have is what can lead an employee to str stress about whether they're going to have a job in the future and that's where the retention of keeping an employee um, I think that financial stability is an important piece of that because employees are looking for that in a career and in, in, in the next step. Well, thank you. And Jennifer, um, with you guys at Hawk, what are what are some ways that you guys are finding and retaining good good people? 
Okay, and, and I'll echo um, and, and agree with Matt that that financial stability and the transparency and being very open um, with your employee base is essential. Um, one of the things that Hawk did in 2019 is did a very thorough market analysis because as all nonprofits are, we do compete with the for-profit world. And then just, in, in, I'm speaking specifically in a development um, role, that there's a heavy competition for those professionals. So they did a market analysis and our board and our leadership were committed to that and they did across the board adjustments as, as they could um, in financial uh, in their financial situations and really invested in their employees. But one thing I'll add to what he said is retaining employees and really having them um, um, have ownership in, in your organization. And that starts with a clear vision from the top. What is our strategic goal? We're not operating day to day, we have a plan. Um, mm -hmm. All nonprofit, uh, well not all nonprofit employees, but our nonprofit employees, they're working to work themselves out of a job. They're working to end something that's bad. They're working to end a, a, an ill in our society. Um, so we have a clear mission. We have, a, we have a, a clear strategic plan and that is communicated down and every employee's role, uh, they are communicated with as to how they play and how they are essential to the achievement of those goals. So I think keeping our, our, um, our employees informed, um, professional development is key we really encourage mobility within the organization, mobility up, mobility lateral, uh, just to learn other skill sets. Um, and so, in, you know, internal applicants are encouraged uh, to to apply for other other positions, and many, many do, and many have been with the organization for a couple of decades. That's great. That's impressive. That's really good to see. Uh, and with the managing and communicating with employees that you mentioned with all of this COVID and all this remote working, what are some things that Hawk is doing to manage that and that workforce remotely? Sure, so um, I would say that we, number one, we've expedited our strategic plan in the area of technology. There was always a plan to be able to have a more remote um, environment and our, our leadership is committed to providing all of the technology to our employees who are providing services, direct and or indirect services from their home. Uh, and, we, and we are able to do that. We've been securing some funding to be able to do that. Hawk has a culture of um, communication, of honest, open communication, and we have maintained that, if not increased that. Uh, regular check-ins with department staffs, regular check-ins with teams. Our CEO is phenomenal at convening all staff meetings and just providing an open, safe environment for conversation. And all of these check-ins are not about what are you doing and what you need to do, they're about how you're doing. And I think that our employees are really appreciating that right now because the job is stressful in any normal situation and any other time. It's very stressful now with the, with the work and, and the home and the children and, and just the stressors of the economy but we truly believe in a work-life balance and self-care and that is open that's honest and that comes from the top so i think we have we have actually increased some of our conversations with our staff um, and, and i do believe that, that that is helping in um, easing some of their concerns and um, helping them feel a little bit better about what they're doing right now Absolutely. That's a great, that's, I think that's a great suggestion. Just having, you know, big team check-ins and seeing how everybody's doing and what's going on with them. Mm -hmm. Get in touch base because I know even with my staff, it's just really hard. I mean, unless you have a reason to call them and a thing to check mm -hmm. on them, you don't really hear from them. They're just right. working away at home. And whereas in the office, you pass by and get to say hi all the time. Kind of like, hey, how's it going? And how's yeah. that we, ha we have to understand that most of our employees did not apply for a job with us to work remotely. Um, right. They are social services. They are committed to people and they're committed to conversations and they're committed to helping. And so this is a transition and, mm -hmm. and it can be uncomfortable for people. And so we need to do all we can as leadership um, and uh, um, our executive team to, to be able to continue those communications. Information session one, reimagining the workplace. This is hosted by Capital. Uh oh, that's a background noise. <laughs> All right, well, and, um, Jennifer, you mentioned technology, and I think that's where I want to go next. And um, I'll start with Matt on this. Technology really isn't ever changing, and it's changing so quickly these days. 
Uh, there's always new versions of software, new equipment. Um, now remote employees need new equipment uh, and, and new ways that people are penetrating your systems and you're having to keep up with that. You know, what are some ways that Senecor is keeping your data safe and, and keeping up with technology? Yeah, uh, sure. I, just to go back to what we were talking about as far as dealing with the stress and program fatigue, I just want to add a couple points. In oh, absolutely. Um, the, the, some, some things that have been helpful for us is we were toying with going remote, and, and, and um, I'll talk a little bit about the technology regarding that, but we were toying with going remote prior to COVID, and that just kind of expounded things dramatically once that occurred. But we're really half and half. We're half in the office and half, um, half uh, remote, and uh, I will agree with Jennifer, doing those regular check-ins with and seeing how your staff are doing are extremely important. Along the lines with that is utilizing the tools that, that, that we have in place as well as to utilize our volunteers to alleviate some of that stress. Um, there are a lot of volunteers out there that will come in and, and, and provide uh, 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 some, some, some work to help reduce that workload and stress as well as having your employee assistance program help with that. One of the things that we started that I think is extremely important to employees letting them know is to celebrate the successes and appreciate their efforts the, that they're doing. Uh, we recently started a Saving More Lives campaign, kind of an email internal campaign where we were recognizing their hard work and efforts uh, of the employees in the facilities and letting them know what the successes are. It's easy to get bogged down into the negatives, but uh, really focusing on the successes um, and what they're doing really helps. With the technology and, and what we've done to go remote and keeping our systems safe is um, utilizing a, a, a couple of things. There are a lot of resources out there for technology for not-for-profit organizations. One of those resources is called TechSoup. And if you've not heard of TechSoup that's out there, they're an organization that provides donations of hardware and software. And it, it's not just um, uh, uh, second-hand hardware or software. They work with organizations like Microsoft, Cisco, Adobe to, uh, to provide donations from those other organizations to not-for-profit organizations. You, 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 you end up paying a small administrative fee, but it can really help your organization grow your technology. It's a great resource to utilize um, in, in getting um, the needed hardware and software for your organization at very minimal cost. Because I think the, res the, the resources is, is some of the hardest part is the resources of getting up to date uh, hardware and software for your organization um, to make sure that you're not only keeping your data safe, but that you're in compliance as well. For us, especially as a healthcare organization, making sure that our data is safe. Um, uh, having, a f having that firewall in place and making sure that your backup of that data is very critical. Uh, something else that we utilized recently was uh, utilizing an, out, uh, an outside organization to come in and look and see how we were doing and then give us some suggestions as well uh, on what we could improve on. But that, that, that tech soup is, um, I, I think, is a great resource to reach out to. That's, yeah, I appreciate you providing that. I've, I've, I've seen several organizations use that and it um, can definitely be a um, quality stuff and in needed information or needed equipment at a reasonable cost and way to use your dollars and make your dollars go further. Um, yeah, and, and it's not, it. yeah, and it's not just, uh, you know, on-site hardware software. It's also, they offer cloud-based uh, services and applications as well. And, you know, when you're, when you're getting into those cloud-based services, for us as a healthcare organization, um, Senecor, we, we, we need to make sure that we're, we're protecting health information. Yeah. And so one, one piece of advice that I could give other not-for-profits is making sure that you've got those business associate, business associate agreements in place uh, with those third parties to help mitigate your risk um, to ensure that your data is safe if you're utilizing um, those third-party cloud applications. Jennifer, did you have anything to add on the technology front? Sure. Um, Hawk also utilizes TechSoup. Um, we have a, an IT department, like a lot of non 
nonprofits of two phenomenal people who, who are able to do yeoman's work to, to provide us with all the technology. Same thing, stringent firewalls, um, while not medical, we do have uh, government and federal uh, confidentiality guidelines for our clients and survivors. And so being able to uh, work in that environment, we do employ several um, uh, very stringent password, uh, we also have two-factor authentic authentication for all of our sign-ons. Um, our, our nightly backups are not only stored um, on-site, but they're stored off-site as well to ensure that redundancy of, of our data. At any given time, we can be running 20 plus federal grants. So just the mass amounts of data must be protected uh, in order to timely be able to report on that. But as I mentioned a little bit earlier in the webinar, we did expedite a little bit our technology plan. And so one other way that we're protecting our, our information is Hawk issued laptops, Hawk issued monitors, and um, our employees being able to check those out and just take them home so that they're, we know that they have the right software, we know they have the right firewalls, we know they have all of the right um, different type of um, virus protections on them that they should have. So we have invested in that. We have been able to use um, some of the very generous donations that have been coming from our donors, our private donors, who just really wanted to help with COVID expenses. And that was a way to utilize some of those funds for health and safety reasons to keep our employees safe um, and, keep our, uh, and keep our operations going was being able to invest in technology. And I think that we have now decided that our future investments in technology are going to look totally different than they used to look. There are no desktops, there are laptops. There's, there's ways that we can be more agile, more flexible and more mobile. And so investments in technology has taken um, a, a really big spotlight over the past few months here at Hawk, um, all in protection of our, of our staff as well as our clients. Yeah, and I, I would say there's a big market for cameras right now. Of course, oh, all of yes. Us <laughs> <laughs> all of us Hard are on the, on the webinars and, 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 and working remotely more than right. having in-person in presentations, but we're finding that they're that finding cameras right now for our employees across um, our, our organization are running real thin. Yeah, they've been on back order for months. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, and thank you both. That's, that's great information. And with, I mean, technology is so important these days and where I'm actually seeing more and more surveys and information coming out too about how, although the technology infrastructure is a management in general expense, a lot of times that it creates more efficiency in the programming and you're able to serve more people. Um, so it's, it's a little bit of a trade-off sometimes that's hard in the, the short run, um, but can be very beneficial in the long run for many organizations to stay on that that forefront and make sure they're staying relevant and not getting left behind on the technology front. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I would say that we were paying almost, we were paying, extra, I was just saying an extraordinary amount for conference calls. Um, and over the past couple months, we went through, through TechSoup to, to provide Office 365 and Teams. Mm -hmm. and if, you're, if you're utilizing Teams, which is a great resource, and it pretty much did away with all of that conference calling uh, altogether. And so we've moved to that Teams platform, and it saves us a lot of it saves us a lot of money every month not to have to pay those phone bills, um, which has helped out tre tremendously. Teams has really been a big uh, factor for us, uh, not only through COVID but also as an organization in collaboration, um, mm -hmm. even even through external organizations. I noticed that uh, the bank that we work with, we've been doing a lot of Teams back and forth as well. Yeah, Teams has been um, a big part of remote auditing for us um, at the firm. So a lot of organizations, and it's great because even if the organization we're working with doesn't have Teams, we can send a Teams invite and we can share monitor, share screens and we can see what they're doing and we can walk through um, information. Teams has been, I mean, so we do it a lot internally. All of our meetings internally right now are on Teams, which is great because you get to see your coworkers. Um, that's but so also externally, it's been a way that we've been able to connect with clients and right. stay connected with everybody that way too. Yeah, I think that's so important. Uh, we, we also use Teams. 
Um, and in fact, Hawk had just started implementation of several new softwares, both Teams, a data management system, a donor management system, a payroll system. All of this was in the Ooh. implementation phase right when all of this happened, but uh, leadership embraced that. Leadership understood the importance of moving forward with that. And so a lot of virtual training has had to occur over the past mm -hmm. several months to get our employees up to speed and comfortable with all of the various softwares. And Teams has been instrumental in that. And just having that connection and being able to see each other, it's much more engaging and I think much more uh, productive in your training environments. Uh, um, and I know, I believe, and I, I'm not a tech savvy person, but I know that that Teams has been a, a nice one because of the, there's not as much risk as with Zoom um, and a lot of the, the challenges with Zoom and firewall things that came with Zoom. Right. So that's what tech, Teams has been great. Um, you know, another part of technology is using technology in your fundraising um, and how because donors and volunteers right now are always very concerned with what is the organization doing? How are they using my money? What is, how, you know, how are we being successful? How many people are you reaching? So maybe Jennifer, why don't you start us off? You know, what is Hawk doing to measure that programmatic, programmatic success and, and communicate that with donors? Sure. Um, so one thing that, that Hawk has is a public strategies office. And so that is a little bit more extensive than the general marketing communications office. It is a strategy office and they are very active and they're very involved. Um, the, the chief public strategies officer sits on our executive leadership team and takes all of those in for all those pieces out. So we have regular ELT meetings where we're gathering information, we're getting input from the various programs, operational review meetings where we're getting you know, um, trends in our, in our different programs. And we are heavy into eBlast and heavy into social media and media presence. So we keep that at the forefront um, of, of, of all of our communications is really getting it out to, to our people. Um, it's so much easier to retain a donor than it is to get a new donor. So we uh, use technology. We have um, a, our database system for our donor management. We utilize that very heavily in getting staff where they, that that's just top of mind. Every time you talk to a donor, you put it in there. Every time you have an action and a follow-up and an assignment. And so that we're able to, to talk with our donors on a regular basis, not always asking them for money. So we have our newsletters, we have our, our blogs, we have our e-blasts and, and other, other opportunities. We, um, in, a, in, a, in a general time, we would have our in-person Hawk Talks and that's where people are invited to come here from community members or survivors or, or any of those. We do publish our annual report. Everything is, is up to date and accurate on our website. That's very important, your website presence. Uh, showing the impact of the programs and services that you do and sharing that with you, with your donors. We like to produce one pagers. It's, it's not a lot of reading. It's just a quick update of what's going on. We made sure in the early, early stages of this that we got into the hands of all of our donors, a one pager on what we were doing during the pandemic and uh, mm -hmm. how our services were uh, needed even, even more than before, but what we were doing to ensure that our, that our clients were receiving everything that we've promised to do to them. So it's that constant communication. You have to put it into their hands. Um, um, you don't wanna overdo it, but you need to be consistent with that uh, and, and gathering as much, you know, as many means that you can communicate with your donors, the better. But our public strategies office does a, a, a fabulous job at keeping the message clear, consistent, and branded. And Matt, I know uh, in fundraising strategies are always, uh, you know, not, or can be very similar from organization to organization. Um, is there anything that, that Senecor is doing on measuring effectiveness or, you know, keeping track of the programmatic successes? Yeah, I, I would echo what, what Jennifer was saying. Um, cultivating the relationship with the donors is extremely important. Um, you know, ha having that social media, the, the e-blast, everything that Jennifer talked about is, is kind of along the same lines of what we're doing. Um, not only providing a Saving More Lives campaign to our internal employees, but letting the community and our donors know um, what our successes are as well. 
Um, mm -hmm. And, and that is through those same platforms that Jennifer was talking about, is sending that out, cultivating that relationship. It is much easier to keep the relationship than build a, a, a new one. Uh, I, I, I will say for Senecor, uh, substance abuse and substance use disorder isn't always the, the, um, the, the grand um, um, thing that donors like to give to. Um, so we, we've always had our challenges with fundraising. Our, our fundraising is relatively smaller. Um, our program income is, is, is where, we're, where, where um, we receive most of our funding, but we do, um, we do have uh, a small base for fundraising and it has been a challenge recently. It has been a challenge getting in front of individuals recently. Mm -hmm. um, it's more uh, remote, which doesn't have the same impact as meeting in person. Mm -hmm. um, as well as a lot of our other referral partners uh, uh, through judicial systems and um, uh, you know other other organizations that do what we do through not only health the physical uh, mental health but also the substance use disorder as well so it's been very difficult recently getting in front of those individuals and we've seen the impacts of that and so we've had to get a little bit creative, but keeping that message out there, echoing what Jennifer said, keeping that message going, keeping it positive and letting your donors know what those results are that you're doing and the things that you're doing now um, keeps it at the forefront of their minds. Yeah, it's, it's so important for the donors to know that they, you know, we've, we've met or we've you know, been successful and we've, we've helped so many people. And so being able, making sure that their social platforms show those successes it's always so important i think um and it seems to be a great way where donors feel like their dollars have gone to a good purpose they've seen that, that, <laughs> that the dollars are making a difference um, obviously as jennifer mentioned earlier you know we're trying in the nonprofit space we're trying to put ourselves out of a job um to to treat everybody and make sure that, and and leave nobody without services but unfortunately uh, the services are open. There seems to be no end in sight, and we need to do more with less. And or, yeah, more with less. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I would say also from from Senecor's perspective, we we relied heavily on a lot of special events, mm -hmm. and those are pretty much shut down. Um, right. We 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 have we have postponed or moved a lot of our special events to later in the year or to next year, and and that has really had a big impact and and. That, that's been a big challenge and we haven't found a, a, a way to uh, replace those. There really isn't a way to replace those. That, that is one way that you cultivate those relationships with those donors is by having those special events and bringing people together. And so um, what, what I've seen though from, from some other organizations is having those virtual special events, which is good, they're good, but they don't hold the same impact as meeting in person. Um, um, we've had a small little bit of success doing things virtually uh, but not near as much as we've seen having them in person. So special events has taken a big, big hit for us. Jennifer, did you want to add anything on how you guys have had to really adapt to this virtual nature of special events and connecting with donors? And how, how are you staying engaged with those donors? Sure. So, so Hawk has two annual events and they had just finished their race against violence the week before we shut our administration building. So they, they got that. Um, they were able to, to continue holding that race. Our other big event is scheduled for Oct in October. Um, we are moving it virtual and we've been attending a lot of virtual uh, fundraising events, trying to get the you know, some things to do, some things not to do. We're trying to make it much more engaging, trying to have a personal reception with our top donors, with the speaker the night before, just little things that we can do to make it a little bit more engaging. But we've had to be creative. They had the special Giving Tuesday and we really took advantage of that. We really promoted um, what Hawk was doing to address domestic and sexual violence in our community. And we saw the fruits of our labor on that. I, I will tell you, I have been extremely uh, pleased and, and excited about the number of new donors that have come forth because we're able to share our message and the impact, the positive impact that we're able to have. So this year we've seen new individual donors, some small numbers and some larger numbers, but I think us being able to communicate with those, we're monitoring daily donations coming in, making personal phone calls, just thanking them for, for thinking about us. 
so we're having to be we're having to be creative and 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 looking at new ways of of sharing our message and and hopefully um, receiving donations. One thing I'll say too is with we're we're about fifty percent government grants and fifty percent uh, philanthropic uh, support, but really leveraging those two I think is so important because we can get a lot of programmatic grants. Um, uh, even, even COVID, pre-COVID, in, in, any type of, of different type of program support, but a lot of um, other expenses that go along with that are not uh, covered by those grant funds. So really stressing the importance of leveraging and what a donor's dollar, how a donor's dollar can truly be stretched if they are, are working, if we're leveraging along with government grants. So I, I like my staff to be fully informed of all operations of the organization, of, of the agency, so that they're cognizant of that when they see donate, when they see grant opportunities or a donor calls and says, hey, what can I do? And we know that we just got a grant for the shelter, but it doesn't pay for X. Well, then maybe that donor can help us pay for X. And so I think keeping our staff informed, all staff, so that they know what's, what's, uh, what the needs are of your agency and you can leverage the different uh, funding sources. Getting unrestricted money um, mm -hmm. is the challenge and more and more of a challenge now um, mm -hmm. like donors do want to attach a purpose to their dollar more and more these days we is a trend I'm seeing more mm -hmm. of um, in this space and speaking of that one of uh, somebody in the audience would like to uh, add a question here and is your organizations raising funds to cover the MGNA expenses when so many grants are only cover program expenses. Um, I mean, for example, government grants usually cap you at 10% on the admin. Um, mm -hmm. There's no fundraising that covers that, uh, you know, and then obviously you have to spend money to make money on the fundraising. So it does take dollars to make dollars. Uh, you know, uh, whoever wants to, to start that up, you know, what are you doing to raise some, some mg a dollars? Uh, I, I'll, I'll start there. Um, you're right. Government grants don't don't provide very much, and and really they are they are starting to even reduce some of the indirect uh, um, indirect funds that you're able to get. I think our board also plays a very big role in that in in sharing our message. We have a very committed board. They understand um, that it takes money to to raise additional money and for program support. And so I think them sharing our message, them being um, going out to their circles of influence. Um, we, we try to promote Hawk's greatest needs, you know, what, what's the greatest need? And so I, I don't think we have a, um, a, a huge problem at raising unrestricted dollars. Previously, right now, people just want to help COVID. And so we've had to have conversations with them about what helping COVID means. And um, yeah, I'll give an example. Um, government grants that want to put direct mo money into the directly into the hands of our clients, which is wonderful, but the administration on that takes a lot. And I think we've been able to share that message, and that's a way to take some of those money where they're really wanting to help with the COVID um, and, and utilize that for all of the administration that it takes, just the, just the general staffing to get that into the hands of our clients. So I, it, it's about being creative and, and, and sharing, again, it's all about sharing that message. Um, I, I think we're doing really well this year with unrestricted dollars. Yeah, I'll, once again, I'll, I'll echo what Jennifer, what Jennifer said. I think the board is extremely critical to, to helping raise your dollars, your unrestricted dollars for your organization. Mm -hmm. not, only, not only assisting in raising those dollars, but I believe that your board should be giving as well. Um, the, 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 any, any, any board members that, that are volunteering on your board should be giving to, to help provide for the organization. We haven't had a lot of um, uh, challenges uh, because we've been able to leverage our program income against our fundraising, which helps us offset some of those uh, management in general and administrative expenses. But for those organizations that do um, on, only receive uh, fundraising grants, then it, it can be challenging, but I, I will say utilizing your board and some of your other donors as, as, a, as a way to leverage and offset those, M, those management general costs. And then um, re, re, redu reducing as much as it, it does take a lot to, especially when you've got government grants, it takes a lot to be in compliance with a lot of those contracts and government grants. And it's way beyond the 10% that, that any, um, government government grant will give you to provide the, 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 
the compliance or just red tape around keeping in compliance with those with those government contracts. So it can be it can be a, a, a big challenge, but utilizing your board and your donors and uh, other resources in the community to help offset those to get your unrestricted dollars. Because there's always a couple of organizations that we reach out to or, or foundations that will give strictly for unrestricted. And because they understand that concern um, of being able to provide those management in general uh, on top of that. Um, I, I will say as well is, is making sure that you're you're uh, documenting specifically what's management in general and what is program, because a lot of times, uh, a lot of times you'll think of, uh, you, you know, uh, an individual who is really management in general, but they're really working a lot of program, um, uh, uh, a lot of program um, services, or they're providing a lot of information or a lot of uh, work towards program, and so making sure that documenting. Uh, offsetting that document documentation around what is management general and what is program and letting your donors know when you're reaching out to them hey this is what we're providing for program and this is what it takes for for me as an individual to provide those services for the program well. yeah i mean in somewhat you guys have both touched on this a little bit but that donor relations is really important in this aspect i think because you can, when you have good relationships with those donors, you can have those open and honest conversations. And when they say, I wanna give you a million dollars to do X, Y, Z, and you go, thank you so much. But let's have a conversation. Let's, let's, let's go over what, is, what that means and how that's gonna impact our organization. And I think it's great that give to that program but I still have to have an accounting person. I still have to have a fund. I, I still have to have all these other people that support that program. And will you consider a portion of it to be unrestricted or, you know, or in, to maybe lessen the restrictions on the organizations to allow for that? And, and the more they know, and the more they understand what your, what your administrative burden is and how that looks like, or even what you're doing to be more efficient. You know, like we have, you know, things that you guys have done to be, you know, to make the, the administrative reduce and what you're doing to try to understand that. And, and also to, to kind of piggyback on what Matt said, a lot of organizations, I will admit that the functional like allocation of expenses is somewhat this afterthought for so many, yeah. where it needs to be in the forethought because if you do really track or you consider what people are doing throughout the year, that allocation of their wages is so much easier come audit time and financial reporting mm -hmm. time. Uh, whereas now, you know, and I, whereas when your auditor or is sitting in your office going, okay, so why is Sally, Sally allocated 85% to management in general when she, you know, is your program person like those kind of questions kind of start to come up exactly um you know and then another thing that we are seeing in the nonprofit space to help with the management and general expenses is collaboration you know collaboration has really become a it's kind of become a little bit of a buzzword in the nonprofit space for a good reason though i think you know for a while there we saw a lot of people wanting to do their own thing, they wanted to start their own nonprofit, they wanted to do it their way. But more and more, we're starting, we see organizations working together, whether it just be referrals to each other and understanding what other organizations offer and how they can complement the services that we do, rather than us trying to broaden our programs and, and try to branch off to things, either mission creep or just isn't right in our wheelhouse. Or it's you know doing coming together and sharing and have some organizations that share administrative staff. They're really not big enough individually to have their own executive director and their own CFO, but together they're the same. They're just uh, they're serving people in different geographic areas, but their missions are the same. So they have joint done joint ventures together, um, and then other times it's just you know bringing in. I know Senecor, for example, has, has done so a lot of collaboration and brought organizations in and done some mergers. Um, 
you know, Matt, can you maybe speak on what are some challenges in that process that you guys have incurred and how did you get through them or what would you suggest to do to, in dealing with them? Yeah, uh, I think that's a great question. Working within behavioral health and healthcare, um, we as an organization really want to treat the whole person. But our niche really is substance abuse treatment services. So we can easily get focused on just substance abuse treatment services, but there are a lot of wraparound services that come along with the substance abuse treatment, which is the physical uh, and mental health side of, of the individual, as well as education, vocation, um, a, a lot of different factors that come into treating the, the whole individual. While, while our, our niche really is around behavioral health and substance abuse, um, partnering with or collaborating with other organizations that provide those other wraparound services is extremely important to, for the success of that individual. We want not only to um, uh, help the individual with their recovery, but then get them into a stable uh, education or a stable uh, job or uh, um, uh, stability with their, their, physical, their physical health, such as uh, an indiv individual who may have diabetes who needs treatment in, in that area. Collaborating with other organizations is extremely important to provide that. We've got a lot of different MOUs that we work with, with not only organizations that provide substance abuse for referrals for different levels of care that we provide, but also through um, uh, uh, different organizations that provide those wraparound services. It can, be, it can be challenging because it's easy to get locked into your niche and focusing on the success of your niche. Um, but w when it comes down to it, there are usually other services that can that wrap around the individual that can help them on the, on the road to success. So collaborating with other organizations like like Hawk um, and, and, and Senecor to be able to provide those wraparound services, because I know that I'm sure that Hawk deals with individuals or, or women that, that deal with substance abuse, but yet they don't provide those substance abuse or use disorder services. Right. Working with an organization like that and collaborating with an organization like that to provide those wraparound services. Jennifer, um, can you speak to what kind of challenges you guys have? Because I know you guys do a lot of collaborating as well. Um, we do. You guys have incurred and how you overcome those challenges. Sure, and, and, and just like Matt said, uh, those, those wraparound services are essential and, and we are mission driven and we need to remain mission focused. You, want, you don't wanna delve too deep because maybe that's on our expertise. So partnering with other agencies, um, if we don't have enough space, we're not gonna create space, we're gonna refer them to another shelter. So we work very closely with related uh, organizations in our area. But we, what we provide is trauma-informed support and counseling and advocacy. So it's about, it's about providing our survivors with the resources and the information they need to make their own decision. And so then connecting them with whatever organization, agency, public, private, that may be out there. Um, one example would be legal services. Well, we don't have legal teams, but we do partner with, a, with an association who provides those services for us. Um, we you know, work with, um, with tra transportation agencies to provide transportation for our clients. So collaboration is key. We can't be the, we can't provide everything, but we need to make sure that we're connecting our clients with all of those resources. And I think those connections are so important. And then nonprofits, when they can, if you can collaborate on funding, most recently we received a grant where we are the fiduciary for that. And we have five other DV agencies that are our subrecipients. They did not have the bandwidth to, to manage the grant on their own. We were able to show to the funder uh, how collaboration just exponentially was going to allow us to provide more services um, to a larger population. And so we're, we're serving as that fiduciary because we have that bandwidth to, to be that, that position. So collaboration, cooperation, partnerships is, is key to any nonprofit. And we have one last polling question for our audience real quick. Um, Jen, if you would, um get that up for us. And this is on collab, just as a curiosity, wanted to see what extent those in the audience are doing collaboration with organizations. You know, whether you've done a merger with another entity, you know, perform, perform some joint activities, um, you're considering a merger or you, you don't do quite, um, you don't have really any collaboration at the moment. And we'll uh, give that just a second. 
And then I think we'll go into our Q and A after, after this. Um, we've got a couple good questions from the audience here. Um, a, a lot of joint activities uh, in the audience, a lot of no formal integration, which is pretty common, which is a lot of what um, both Jennifer and Matt talked about, collaborating, referring. I, I think that's so important in the space, knowing what you're good at and sticking to what you're good at, um, you know, and rather than trying to have a lot of branches that you're maybe not quite as good at, whereas another organization that is their bread and butter, let them do that um, and then and stick to what you're good at. So one of the questions that came in from the audience for both of you um, is on volunteering in this time and time of craziness. Uh, you know, both organizations rely on volunteers. How has volunteerism changed as a result of COVID-19? You know, for instance, Hawk, you're, uh, they mentioned your back to school drive, which is usually in August. You know, what changes have been made? So we, we did make the decision that we would not be utilizing volunteers right now, just for the safety of our volunteers. But our, also our education administration building where most volunteer activities, a lot of the volunteer activities would occur is currently closed. So we, we're not having any, really anyone in there except for a few staff here and there. So volunteer, um, we, we get a lot of requests from various service organizations who want to help with that, help us. Um, we were even limiting our in-kind donations just because we didn't have the staff to take those in. So we're having to be creative with them. And what we have found is some of them really want to provide that, um, provide that hands-on, tangible volunteer service, but they understand. And so some have been donating funds. I know a lot of organizations, um, especially literacy organizations, nonprofits and such, who are doing virtual readings to children. Um, and, and I think during the school year, our HISD campus, we had some virtual dance instructors, some virtual art instructors. So these people who wanted to volunteer, who generally would be at our shelter helping our children, but could not be, they're adapting to try to help us. With our backpack program, generally we distribute 800 backpacks, um, age appropriate backpacks, and we're not able to do that in the same manner. So we're partnering with a, we're partnering actually with the YMCA. Uh, because they have a, a different volunteer structure where they're going to be able to assist us with that with that distribution. So all of our people are wanting to continue doing it, but volunteerism looks a whole lot different right now. Matt, uh, the level of volunteerism with you guys is maybe a little bit different, but do you have anything that you could add how you guys have had to modify under, under COVID-19? Yeah. Uh a lot of our volunteers come in the form of counselors or counselor interns from schools or uh, uh, different organizations that are trying to get their hours um, to be able to get their licensing. And so our, our facilities, since they're still open, we, we are still allowing those volunteers or counselors to come in to get their hours um, into those facilities. Our facilities have taken all the precautions necessary um, with, with COVID um, as far as the, the, the standard uh, of protocols that everybody's taking uh, across organizations, but we're still allowing those volunteers to come in. A lot of our other volunteers are through special events. And once again, that's pretty much shut down right now. So it, it's changed a lot in terms of having volunteers outside of, of, our, our, of our regular um, interns that we provide. Um, it, 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 it's, it's, it's tough right now. It really is tough being able to provide um, uh, any type of special events with any type of volunteers. But I, I, I will say that if there are volunteers out there that are willing to volunteer at this time for your organization and you are taking those necessary protocols and procedures mm -hmm. uh, and, and precautions in place to take advantage of those volunteers right now, the, the individuals that aren't potentially working that want to volunteer, that could really help your organization. Yeah, I know I've seen, I mean, the food banks still have people coming in to help sort, but everybody's wearing masks and everybody's staying, uh, you know, six feet apart and trying to, and sanitizing and making sure you really kind of, you know, do all those safety precautions. So we're still seeing some volunteering uh, going on in, in the nonprofit space. And I think we'll, maybe one last uh, question, you know, with virtual fundraising, another question from the audience, do you find that your ask has to be reduced because you're not providing, you know, food and beverage, et cetera, like with virtual, have, have you guys seen that with the virtual giving or the virtual 
galas and the virtual events? Are we, you know, have you seen where the, the ask of like a, of the participation or is, is maybe just a lower dollar amount because they're not getting anything back? Or are you guys just asking for, or what do you uh, say? I would say that we're, we're continuing to ask. We still have a need for our organization. Okay. Yeah, we, yeah, we just have less cost associated with providing that event. Um, so that's just more dollars for the for the organization. Uh, realizing that the, that the donor is really giving the funds for the organization and raising the money for the programs that you're providing, not necessarily to offset the cost of the food or the beverage. Um, while that is that is the perk of of, of having of having that particular event. Um, um, not having that cost actually uh, benefits your organization uh, more than anything, especially if donors are willing to give uh, on top of uh, not, not specifically having that get, but willing to give on top of for your program. Well, I want to say thank you both for being part, uh, part of this. I think it was a great conversation. I really enjoy it, hearing what each of you guys are, are doing and how you guys are changing and adapting to, to these crazy times and just in general, how you guys are serving the, uh, serving the, the space and providing services. And I think Jen has just one last um, quick reminders for everybody out there. And thank you all for, for listening. Perfect. Thank you, Nicole, Matt, Jennifer. It was a very enlightening discussion and it was absolutely fantastic. So I echo Nicole's thanks in participating with us today. Uh, I would like to let everyone know that CPE certificates will be sent via email to all attendees within two weeks. Uh, if you did attend via phone only, please send an email to jlemansky at pkftexas.com indicating that you would also like to receive CPE credit for this webinar. Additionally, the recording of the webinar will be posted to the PK of Texas YouTube channel. So if there was something that you missed or want to re-listen to, you can access that next week. Please be advised that watching the recording will not qualify you to receive CPE. When this webinar ends, you'll receive a pop-up link to an evaluation. Please take a few minutes to provide your feedback as well as share additional topics you would like us to cover in future sessions. Your feedback is valuable and helps us design future uh, seminars and webinars. The link will, to the evaluation will also be provided in a follow-up email that you'll receive. Thank you, everyone, and have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for watching this recording of our Zoom webinar. A quick reminder that watching this video will not qualify you for CPE credit. For more information about PKF Texas's upcoming webinars, contact Jay Lemansky at pkftexas.com and stay tuned for future topics.